So dear friends, I'm happy to speak to you once again. We are in mid-September, the weather is improving and we are once again back to the normal. Let me begin with the message of this week. The gospel that speaks of a very pertinent, challenging and perhaps some it might disturb also that Jesus requests and insists on choosing only one God in our life. What's the meaning of this? Is God something that I can go on choosing from, from among many? Is God something that perhaps a variety that I can say, I like this God, I like that God. <coughs> Jesus says in today's gospel, no man can be, <coughs> no man can serve two masters. Either he serves one fully and perhaps goes a little slow on the other side, or perhaps he loves the other one and leaves this main God. No man can serve two masters. You know, those people who are close to the river, to the sea, they know what it means to sit in a boat. And when you sit in a boat, the boat perhaps takes you, you row it. But if there are two boats, try it, or let us say, put your legs in both the boats. You know, either you split like that and you fall in the middle, you can't row two boats together. Or rather, you can't put your feet into two boats, something like that, you cannot serve two gods. The mammon, that means the money, the power, the prestige, everything that is connected with the world. And secondly, God himself. We can't make a choice to say that for some time I will take this God, another sometimes perhaps I will take the other God. You can't serve two masters. And so much has to be your concentration on the God that you choose, the real living God, as represented by Jesus in the Holy Trinity. He mirrors the whole Trinity and makes, brings the whole Trinity to us. And therefore, we have to love our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. And that is the commandment for us. And Jesus gives an example to say that perhaps the example of the people in the world who have taken certain things as their God, money is their God, or perhaps money is their important, most important factor in their life and how much they would work for it. There are people who work day and night in order to secure more and more money, more bonds, more shares. There are so many people perhaps who are who don't sleep, they are always tensed up, what may happen, my shares may crash. And there are so many people, I am saying, we have so much focused on the money itself and money, our riches, our wealth, our gold, perhaps everything is connected to the world is passing, is passing, not remaining. Only God is permanent. And therefore, Jesus also gives an example to say that how perhaps this particular steward who, has, who is to be removed and naturally he gets the news that he may be removed and in order to work out his retirement or perhaps time after he's removed, he calls the servants and since he was a steward perhaps who was in charge of many things, he calls one and says, how many barrels of oil that you were yeah, that you had taken a loan from my master and he says 100, write 50. Another one he gives another concession, another gives another concession. And Jesus praises this particular steward to say for his astuteness, for his brains to say that in order to save himself, how he makes these concessions or these perhaps adjustments. The people of the world, they would do anything in order to make the adjustments. 
And so Jesus says, if this is the trend or this is the perhaps attitude, how much more should we be working for the kingdom of God ceaselessly, day and night? We can even make use of these perhaps ideas of these persons, not for the evil, but in order to do good. And perhaps the people are blessed with wealth. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. Money, wealth, richness can also be considered as a blessing. But they are not absolutes. They are not absolutes. Money is not absolute. Gold is perhaps nothing permanent in that. And therefore, Perhaps we can make use of these things also in order to gain certain merits or certain points for us, certain bonus points for us for the kingdom. The people who are rich, perhaps they can give some of their money to the poor. The people who have got wealth perhaps can share it with the others who do not have. And in this way, we can also make use of these things that God has blessed us with, what we call the physical things, the tangible things, in order to in order to secure the kingdom of God, which is not tangible, which cannot be counted, which cannot be measured, which cannot be timed as such. So that is the message of today, that we strive towards what is godly and perhaps do not consider much what is earthly. And that is why in order to get what is godly, we have to be serious, we have to be focused, our hearts and minds have to be with God. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will fall in line. My dear friends, I now take you to the certain situations in our diocese which I try to bring to your notice in order to make ourselves feel as a archdiocese. We have to open to be a, open to the others. We have to have our ears and eyes our minds open to everything. I speak today about the migrants. Not just because I would like to speak about the migrants. The Holy Father celebrates, the Universal Church celebrates the World Day of Migrants once a year. And the Holy Father shifted it to the month of September. And 25th of this month is going to be the World Day of Migrants. When I say migrants, Bangalore perhaps has got a, a special place for the migrants because there are many migrants flowing into Bangalore. They come from all sides. They come from north, south, east and west. And Bangalore is something like a El Dorado for them, a place of their dreams where they think perhaps they get their jobs, they can get more money, they can also have the students can study, people can do business, and everyone thinks that they will be happy here. Nothing wrong with that. The migrants come from many places. The migrants are mostly poor. If things were okay in their own places, if they had their money and perhaps resources, they would not have to come to Bangalore. But knowing that perhaps their crops have failed, their fields have been abandoned, Many a time there has been a lot of injustice done to them. People have not even considered their, their needs and the forests have been destroyed, their houses have been taken over and therefore they leave their houses and come all the way to a city like Bangalore and the other cities also in order to find a future, to find a life and to make themselves adjustable, comfortable in this city. The Holy Father has a very special message this year for the migrants that I said will be celebrated on 25th of September. And the theme is building the future with the migrants and the refugees. It's the 108th day of migration that is celebrated. Building the future with migrants and refugees. A beautiful theme. You know, normally those who have look down upon those who do not have. And those who have think that we have got everything. Why should we be disturbed by the other people? But the civilization and history of the world says that no man can live alone. No civilization can exist alone. 
then perhaps there are some civilizations who have tried to resist the migrants, the outsiders, and have grown up, but then they are closed up. They are closed up. But look at the other countries which have received the migrants, and the migrants have come and settled down. They have amalgamated, they have integrated themselves with the rest of the country, the rest of the people. Countries like America, countries like Austria, Australia, New Zealand, the European countries who have taken the migrants. Perhaps nowadays we don't see that much of welcome or perhaps asking the migrants to come. Everyone shuns the migrants, even Europe and the Americas, and perhaps to a certain extent India also tries to push the migrants away. We have no place for you. We, are, we do not wish to be disturbed. We are comfortable. We do not wish to be that you take away the gifts or perhaps benefits that we have for yourself. This seems to be the language, the attitude. So in this sense, we have to remind the people to say that the country, the civilizations or society was built with migrants. You know, the migrants come with a different culture, different attitudes, different food habits, perhaps different languages, and a flower, a flowering of many other qualities and characteristics. And so the country that accepts the, the migrants and refugees, of course, in the beginning it's difficult to adjust. We may have to sacrifice a lot. We have to make, perhaps we share many things with them, and it's not easy. But the countries that have done it surely have experienced a lot of integration and a lot of richness, a lot of variety. We see the variety is a spice of life, and the migrants bring this spice, as it were, with them. So therefore, we, we accept the migrants that are in Bangalore. We try to make them comfortable to some extent, and one of these days I will be also having a meeting with the migrants as to see how they can be accommodated at the same time that how they could integrate themselves. Of course, the attitude of the migrants is they don't come here to stay forever. Many of them would like to go back and go back perhaps comfortably when they are settled. But there will be some who settle down here. When the children start growing here, when the children start perhaps attending the schools, they would like to stay here. And surely they would be our future citizens, our companions, as it were, someone who will be part of our life. So let the church also be welcoming. The church is called a mother. She takes everything in her embrace. And therefore, let the church in Bangalore also consider these migrants as someone who are positive, who perhaps will give us may not be money and wealth, but with their culture, with their openness of heart, with their characteristics, with their morality, perhaps they might also enrich our society. As I said, I would like to have a meeting uh, start to, to start with. There are migrant priests and religious in the city of Bangalore who are vocations of the different congregations who have come in here, who are serving Bangalore and the congregations themselves. I would like to meet them and surely perhaps with them, through them, I can work out also a greater type of accommodation or perhaps acceptance of the migrants that come to Bangalore in big numbers. Let me now go over to a few celebrations that are very special to our Archdiocese. You know, I would like to speak about the Feast of Mother of Mines in Urgum. I happened to go for this feast last Sunday and it was a beautiful experience for me. Of course, the priest, Father Xavier Nanam, and he was calling me quite often. I could not go in my first year, three years back. And two years, of course, there was no feast celebration that could merit any attention because of Corona. And this year, it was a happy occasion to see the crowds flowing into Urukum. I am told this feast was celebration was started by a certain priest called Father Balaya. And this year was the 47th year of the feast. What was special was that the people of whole of KGF were there, the Hindus, the Muslims, 
and the other pilgrims from Bangalore, so many other places, perhaps from Tamil Nadu also, all flowing into the mother of minds. It's a beautiful theme. I said that day to the people to say that, you know, the mother of minds, perhaps there is no title of that sort anywhere in the world and Bangalore Archdiocese has got this title or rather given to Mother Mary this title because the minds were part and parcel of our history, of our geography and of our Archdiocese in KGF. The minds are closed now. Perhaps they may not may be open, may not be open, but then our people have known for the last hundred years that they have profited from the mines. Of course, there have been a lot of losses. Many people have died in the mines. Many people have worked hard in the mines. And now that they do not have jobs, surely the mother of mines, we say, perhaps if even if mines are not there, our mother Mary is there. I have told the people that our mines are gold, our money may come and go. But Mother Mary, Jesus is still with us and will remain with us. So therefore, I was very much impressed to see thousands of people flocking that day in uh, Urugum, a uh, place of Mother of Mines, where Father Saviour was very much active and organized the feast well. And I speak about the others. I spoke about the migrants. Bangalore is also, the church is rich with variety. Bangalore is one of those archdioceses which has got the other rites or ritual churches also here in Bangalore. We have the Siromalabar church, we have the Siromalankara church, we have the Siromalabar diocese itself, the diocese of Mandya, and which the Siromalabar Christians of Bangalore also and the larger part, the other districts also come unto them. I speak of these oriental churches, ritual churches, because they are part and parcel of our church, our culture. Before the church, before the diocese were formed on the ritual configurations, they all came under the Archdiocese of Bangalore. We were happy to have them. Many of them have served our parishes. Many of them have contributed to our parishes. Some of our churches, lands also were part of the earth which they have given to us. And surely we wholeheartedly accept our Siro Malabar brothers and sisters, our Siro Malankara brothers and sisters. I mention this because just this week, the Siro Malabar Diocese of Mandya along with their bishop, the priest came here for a retreat in Palanabhavan. It was so nice to see the priest with the bishop doing their retreat in this house and they were very grateful to us and I, was also, I also addressed the priest and some priests of our diocese also and there was a lot of interaction to say that we have much to gain. Ritually perhaps we celebrate the liturgies in this way, they will be celebrated in another way, that does not matter. We believe in the same God. We believe in the same Bible, the same Jesus Christ. This is all ecumenical. More than that, we have the Holy Father as our head. And therefore, we also, I also told the Sirumalabar Bishop, Bishop Sebastian Adiantarat, and the priest that let us combine together, let us work together in serving our people. Whatever perhaps we can share together, we bring together, let us not duplicate matters. And whenever we need help and support from each other, let us be free to ask each other, help each other, so that in the end, our people profit by this. I spoke about, for example, the funerals or the burial grounds. I can understand that the Sirumalabar and Sirumalankara people do not have that much of cemeteries here or this one. I, we also are in crisis. We also don't have place. But then the burying the dead is one of the greatest acts of mercy that we can do. So therefore we said we will try to adjust, we'll try to find a place, we'll try to share our resources in order to be together. And therefore I welcome, I thank the Bishop Sebastian and all the priests who came here for retreat. Please continue praying for us and we will also discuss ways and means that we can combine. Now, one of the priests also suggested why do we why can't we have a meeting of the Siro Malabar clergy 
and the Latin clergy of the Archdiocese of Bangalore together. I said, surely it's a good idea. Our priests would be happy to meet your priests and there might be much for us to exchange between us. We will surely continue this exercise. One of the services that we are rendering to the Archdiocese is the service of education. As you are aware, we have about 50, 60 clusters of schools among us in the Archdiocese. In the same campus, the KG class, the primary, the high school, sometimes even the PUC together. And so about 60 to 70 sort of these kind of entities we have in the Archdiocese, the Archdiocesan Board of Education. We have this board running for many years, managing many of our schools and institutions. It's a difficult job, especially for diocesan priests, because as priests, we are committed to the parishes, to the people, and to this may not be a diversion as such, but then this is also important for us that we give good education to our children. Many of our priests are doing double job. They are managers, in the schools and at the same time full-time parish priests in their parishes. And of late we have also tried to put certain priests independent, independently in charge of the, of the schools and institutions so that they can give more time and energy to the students, to the children. We can understand that most of our diocesan schools cater to the children of the parish the poor children, the marginalized. I also have requested that the migrant children also be taken in our schools. It's not an easy job for a priest to do two or three things at one time and at the same time do justice to the school, to the, to the institutions and in this way try to perhaps bring up our children. We would like to bring up all our institutions, make them have a high standard so that even the poor who come are not deprived of a educational standard that they perhaps would like to be benefit from our institutions. So therefore, I request your help and support also for our educational institutions of the Archdiocese, the Archdiocese and Board of Education, which manages the schools with the help of our priests and some religious sisters and the other religious priests who are helping us. I commend their work and appreciate them and surely God will bless them for the sacrifices they are making for our children. Let me now take you over to one more small topic that perhaps you are already following, what we call the anti-conversion bill. You may have heard in the last three, four days, the government of Karnataka has fully brought into force the act of the anti-conversion bill. Earlier, since they did not have the numbers in the upper house, they had invoked the presidential ordinance and it was in force. But now having enough numbers, sufficient numbers in the upper house, they have passed it a law. And so from last two, three days, the law is fully in force what is called the anti-conversion bill, the protection of the freedom of religion of the people in Karnataka. I have sent my reactions to it, that it's sad, it is shocking and disturbing also. I say this because the government of Karnataka knows very well what the Christians have been doing in Karnataka. Perhaps there are some isolated incidents of conversion here and there, for which I say that and I repeat that government can surely take action and should take action because no one should convert the other persons of other religion forcefully or through fraudulent methods, means, incentives should not be done. This is not correct. Our religion itself does, does not encourage it, it forbids it. It forbids it, just as perhaps the message of today, we cannot serve two masters. We can't be one to the world, one to God. And just because someone is giving money or someone is forcing you, you should not change your religion. And we shall not do it. I said I am sad because the government of Karnataka, knowing that the immense goodness that is coming out of the Christian community, 
the number of institutions, the number of schools, the number of social centers, the number of the old age homes, the number of specially able children and the people taken care of, the prisoners, ministry of the prisoners, so many good things that have been taken which are not taken note of. And they have all labeled as not very safe, that we are out to convert the people, we are out to force the people in order to join our religion. I have made a even a challenging statement in the past. We have so many children studying in our schools and institutions, lakhs of them. Give us one example of why one student was converted in our schools. It has not been. So also now also perhaps this act has been passed, but then we are sorry, we are sad, we are disturbed, but then we ask God for help and support because ultimately God is our master. And our scriptures, letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1 says, We have to pray for our, those who rule over us, our kings, rulers, those in government, those in high places, we have to pray for them because God has to give them discernment. Authority comes from God. They have to use it well. So therefore, we pray very specially for our government that this may not be a tool to harass us because the anti-conversion bill in itself, perhaps we will surely challenge it in the courts in to the extent that is possible. The ordinance is already in the court and I would not like to make more statements because when the matter is in the court, I should not be making any judgment as such. But we will seek the help of the government, the courts, in order to do what we can. At the same time, I request the government that the fringe elements that may take advantage of this in order to find out where the Christians are living, what are they doing, where are they praying, what are the means, what are the this one, this is not a good thing. I can trust the police, I can trust the authorities, but the fringe elements and especially in places where there is not much of protection in North Karnataka, whether the churches are far and distant, where the things are, there is no convenience, there are no phones there. And therefore, in these places, harassing our people perhaps may not be the right thing. And surely, the government should give us protection in these times and these places. I pray for the government in a very special way, especially the Karnataka government. There are many good things that they have done, and surely we appreciate them. And it would be nice if perhaps out of wisdom and the discernment, the government itself says that this is not the right move that we have done. Let me now go over to the another celebration that we have this week, what we call, perhaps very strange for us, the Feast of the Korean Martyrs. The 20th of September, the church celebrates the Feast of Korean Martyrs. What connection it has got to our diocese or perhaps to India. I'm smiling. Perhaps God has his own ways. You know, Korea, North Korea and South Korea are new Christians, are new Christians. They, were, they became Christians only through the underhand or perhaps underground activities of some missionaries who dared to go there and to preach the gospel very, very secretly. And in the 18th century, in the 18th century, the faith has come to India 2,000 years ago. But here, just about 200 or 300 years ago, they became Christians. And surprisingly, in the 19th century, 1834, I think so, we see that there are martyrs who bravely laid down their life for Christ. There was this Chinese dynasty that was ruling Korea, and they were, they were ruthless to say that they cannot be any other religion. And naturally, Christians were not encouraged. Christianity was not encouraged. And about 8,000 to 10,000 Christians were martyred at one time. You can imagine one person giving his life for God. You can imagine another two or three, but... 10,000 people going forward in a line to say that we are ready to die for Christ. And 103 of them were declared saints in 1984 
by Pope John Paul II. Of them, there was a priest also, underground priest, of course, secretly administering the people. His name was Andrew Kim. He, along with his companions, 103 of them, were beatified and canonized as saints. And once again, in 2014, 123 of them have been declared venerable. And I am told that there are more on the list to be beatified. It's like a, an angel, an army of saints of one country represented in heaven. And surely what joy it must be for them to see that. But for me, it's perhaps, it's a message that we have faith from long, long time. Surely we have martyrs, small martyrs. We, I mean, I don't say small martyrs, big martyrs we have, but a small number. St. Thomas himself, our uh, Gonzalo Garcia from, from the Basin or the Bombay side, who from India went to Japan and became a martyr. We have also recently, the Holy Father has canonized Deva Sagayam, who died as a martyr. And so we have also martyrs in our country. But then a big army like this we do not have. I think I might make, I should make a reference to what we call the Kandamal martyrs. You know, 12 years back in the month of August, the Kandamal, there was an uprising and attacks on the Christians. The houses were burnt, the people were scattered, and about 60 to 70 Christians were killed. They died in the fires, they died in the violence, as it were. And perhaps India, in the future, perhaps these saints or these martyrs of a place like Khandamal, which are once again new Christians, they are not as old as us. Thousands of years, they are new Christians who daringly give witness to their faith. So I, my secret desire, or perhaps humble request to God is, to honor our country also with these martyrs, so that any opposition, any persecution that may come as regards the bills, as regards the exercise, as regards perhaps restrictions, may not hinder us in the furthering of our faith and flowering of new martyrs in our country. I now go over to the questions that have been asked. There's a very interesting question that has been asked. And the question is, are there any guidelines from the church for bringing toddlers for Holy Mass on Sunday. You know, toddlers, little children, babies. Number two is parents bring their toddlers and sit in the front bench, leaving the child to walk and play near the altar. This is disturbing to the priest, especially during the readings, gospel and homily, and also to the parishioners. And the third question is, is it possible for parents with toddlers to attend the children's Mass or or some other arrangements can be made for them to sit behind where there is no disturbance during the Mass. Beautiful question because it's a practical question. The practical, I don't say difficulty as such because the children are never difficult. The children are always welcome in our parishes, in our churches. How nice it is to see a mother carrying her baby to the church. How nice it is to see the father and the family coming together with their children, leading them to the this one. Perhaps for the children, it's also it's a beautiful example, beautiful memories, and something that will bind them together. Regarding the toddler, the small ones, you know, you can't discipline them. They are always bumping and jumping here. And we find in, even in the papal gathering, in the Holy Father's gathering, there are some children who walk. And perhaps you might have seen the video shots of the children go to the Holy Father's son and Holy Father takes them, keeps them, talks to them. Perhaps this is part of our life. But the question that is asked is, uh, should the children disturb the Mass? I don't think the children have an intention to disturb the Mass. They want to play. But for the parents, perhaps this is a small suggestion there, that don't make the children walk about or go about, because the Mass is also important, the announcements, the sermon, the readings are important for the people. And naturally, when the child is moving this side, that side, the people's attention also gets disturbed. Sometimes the children also fall. And in one place, I remember that two, three people came running to pick up their child. They had fallen from the steps, etc. 
these can happen and therefore this is a practical advice i don't want to give any commandments as such that the children should not be brought to the church and all it doesn't look nice but for the parents to be sensible enough to sit somewhere at the side or have some behind catch hold of their children don't allow the children of theirs to come in the center to become center of attraction as such the second question is little more pointed parents bring out toddlers and sit this is disturbing etc and therefore the children also to be taken care of i don't tell the mothers don't bring the children bring the children and that also perhaps connects the mother with the god with the and the child with mother mary with the church itself the third question which i think i have to make a small comment is it possible for parents with toddlers to attend the children's mass with some arrangements for them to sit behind where there is no disturbance during the mass we have already started this there are three churches of our raj in fact four churches in our arch diocese we have got a small what we call cubicle in the church a glass panel one where it is made sound proof the mothers can sit with their children feed their babies also and the children also can see from outside the mass the whole mass sometimes even the screen is put there so that the mass is attended by the parents rather the mother and the child and at the same time the people are also happy or not not disturbed we have got four churches in our diocese the church of sacred heart in bellandur the church of uh, sacred heart in uh, richmond town the St Francis Xavier Cathedral and also the shrine of infant Jesus in Vivekanagar in these four places perhaps people can go and see there there's a beautiful beautiful cubicle that is made from where the people the sorry the child and the mother can sit there is a little privacy also for the mother to feed the child and etc we have also said that these cubicles since we can't multiply cubicles can be also used by the specially abled children and their parents sometimes they also need a little of privacy a little of perhaps not that they are disturbing as such but they are not conscious of disturbing the people etc for that sake perhaps even if they talk even if they shout even if they scream it's a sound proof cubicle that has been made so i welcome the children with their parents and more and more churches perhaps can think of these small cubicles you make a small contribution there might be some donors and sponsors also which the parish priest they can can take into consideration and make the people happy i wish you a very happy weekend